Of all the cars in the Aston Martin folio, it's the V8 Vantage that's played the biggest part in the company's modern day revival. 2012 marks a host of new revisions. It's got new alloy wheels, an aggressive rear diffuser, an extravagant ducktail spoiler, as well as a revised 4.7 litre V8, now developing 420 brake horsepower. But to see if it's still the ultimate GT car, we're going on a 300 mile road trip from here in Folkestone to a little industrial town in Midwest France called Le Mans, which just happens to host the most iconic and spectacular endurance race of all time. Well, seeing as it's five o'clock, I think first off, we need a coffee. The 24 Hours of Le Mans is the world's oldest active sports car endurance race, having been held since 1923. It's also pretty special for Aston Martin, who won this event back in 1959, which is why we're hoping to get the seal of approval travelling down in this car. There seems to be a lot of heat on Twitter about the presence of gendarmes over on the other side of the border, ready to get the Brits coming down for Le Mans through the speed trap, so I will be very firmly sticking to the speed limits. However, an advantage of being in the V8 is that its wider track necessitates you being in one of these double height carriages, and these are located right at the front of the train, so we've just done a jump on the majority of the other passengers. Resisting the temptation to blip the throttle. <laughs> Alright, just once. We're making really good progress on the auto routes now. The more I'm driving this car, the more I start to appreciate the craftsmanship. It's just beautiful. Plus all the interaction of the controls. I know there's a tendency for sports cars now to adopt automatic gearboxes for ease of use and what have you, but I just think the simple pleasure of having a really sweet shifting stick shift in a car like this is abundantly clear. You just find it so rewarding when you can match one of those red line up shifts or a heel and toe down shift. And as a present, you're almost given that amazing V8 soundtrack. Just listen to it, it's just off the scale. And that sound is definitely more engine note than exhaust noise. I mean, a lot of supercars now tend to have these baffles that outlet and what have you, and they make an amazing sound, but it's more noise. You know, you get a real V8 culture with this car. If there's one criticism that I had to label at this car, it's very small, but it would be the dials. They are stunning to look at. You'll spend hours in front of the things, but in reality, they're unreadable. I mean, this Speedo, for example, runs to 220 miles an hour, yet the car's top speed's 180. What's more, your window, that means, between naught and the legal speed of 70 miles an hour or 130 kph in this case, is tiny. So it makes it really difficult to place the needle between 130 kph or 110 kph. And somehow, I don't think the gendarmes are going to take too well to that kind of an excuse. Both British teams and drivers have had great success at Le Mans, and more than 50,000 British race fans come down each year hoping for more. Whether it's Arnage Village or the Old Town, you won't be short of a lively crowd or of a place to pitch your tent, but I don't think campsites will ever look this glamorous again. Time to check out the pit lane and get close up to some of those phenomenal races. The challenge with endurance racing isn't whether a car can successfully complete a fastest lap, it's whether it can complete 350 or more consistently fast laps. These boys and girls take a Formula One season and race it in a weekend. That's the real challenge and that's why this kind of racing fosters so much innovation. In terms of the competition, you've got three categories really. Le Mans prototype split between LMP1 and LMP2, that's where the Audis have been dominant for so long. Then there's the Grand Touring Endurance category, which is where Aston is competing. Again split into two camps, GTE Pro and GTE Am, which only allows one professional driver. 
And finally, we get to garage number 56, which is in a category of its own for innovation. And this year, it's hosted by Nissan, who have presented the Delta Wing, a car that uses the same engine as a Nissan Juke, the 1.6 litre petrol, but power's been ramped up to 300 brake horsepower. And it should be able to complete this race by only using half the fuel of some of these competitors. While the Audi LMP1s bear no resemblance to the Audis we see on the road, the Aston Martin GT racers start with the same chassis as the regular V8 road car. Shame the costs don't remain similar too. You're going to need upwards of £80,000 to drive a V8 Vantage on the road, but if you wanted to take one on the track, then you need this GT3 version, which will set you back £325,000. into the racing now and as you can hear the noise is absolutely off the scale. If you really do this, you definitely need ear guards and don't even think about sleeping for the next 24 hours. In terms of the racing, it's really tight. We're already seeing loads of changes of position and a few accidents as well. But the atmosphere just hasn't changed. I thought it would peak at the start to be honest but everybody's still well up for it. We're all really looking forward to the daytime turning into night because that's when the racing gets really competitive and all the drivers have to really dig in. Stefan's just come in with a punctured tyre, hence why you've got the Michelin man there that's assigned to every race team, checking through the tyres now. It also means that Darren Turner, the British driver, has gone in a little bit early, so he's lost out on a little bit of sleep and had to jump in the car, um, unbeknownst him really, 20 minutes before his shift was supposed to start. Behind the scenes of Aston Martin Racing, car number 97 also has 10 spare sets of rims, and all these different tyres from these slicks, there are three different compounds of slicks that they work with, which is what they're running on now because it's night and the temperature's quite cool. But they've also got wets and full wets. And if it goes really wrong, there's even some two spare sets of engines. At the moment there's a lot of comms going on because the temperature's dropping, so tyre compounds come into play. We've just switched tyre compounds now for Darren's din. Um, we'll see how that goes on. The team get themselves so built up, so focused on this and other key events in the year, this, this more than anything, that there's enough adrenaline and desire and passion um, to keep them going through the 24 hours. And it's, it's a sprint race, it's incredible. The night hadn't been a sprint, it had been about survival. Usually I'd be reading the papers on a Sunday, but coming down the Porsche curves, watching cars go around the whole an hour, it's much more fun. 24 hours since this epic race began, Audi had again displayed their dominance at Le Mans with an emphatic 1-2-3 on the podium. It was their 11th victory in 13 years and the first ever win for a hybrid powered car. The Delta Wing crashed out in a horrible case of misfortune, but still Nissan demonstrated that sometimes you need to drive past the conventional wisdom to fully engage a green racing revolution. And as for car number 97, the strategists, the drivers, and the passion from all the people at Aston Martin I had been standing alongside just hours before had all come good with a very well-deserved third spot on the GTE podium. So does DNA Motorsport help in developing road cars? Absolutely. And the V8 Vantage is a fine companion for any road trip. 